Uh, let's uh, welcome in our first guest of the program because this is a big day. Joseph Joey Torts Ferretti, attorney at law at the Mansion Ferretti Law Firm. Good morning, Joseph. It's not a big day because I'm on the radio, is it, Rob? It's always a big day. <laughs> like Mike Tomlin says, it's a big game because we're playing in it. So it's a, it's a big show because Joe Ferretti's in it. Uh, uh, that's kind of you to say. Good morning, fellas. Good, Good morning. morning. And you are not with us tomorrow, so it's not as big of a show tomorrow, Joe. Oh, okay. I think you're go you're you're golfing in a tournament again tomorrow, right? I, I am. Yeah, it's it's our annual member member tournament, uh, and uh, it's just a lot of fun. You you pick a member here that you play with, and you, it's like a team event. So uh, looking forward to it. Even though my thermometer on my truck yesterday hit a hundred and five degrees, oof. So it's a little toasty. Yeah, the life of an attorney is just exhausting i don't know how y'all do it well it's, it's the heat and humidity yeah. careful careful there mr gilstrap <laughs> yeah, i know you're an author <laughs> i like when we have authors in and, and they're sitting here with gilstrap and they'll talk and they'll go well, of course i don't write for the money because of course there's no money in publishing books <laughs> i always look at gilstrap and he's just sitting there like the cat that caught the mouse and yeah. a bunch more <laughs> i sit very quietly <laughs> Uh, Joe, a couple of things. We want to get to the presidential debate uh, tonight as well, but uh, just a few more minutes till we get to that. Let's talk about some recent Supreme Court decisions and a few more that are uh, coming our way. They're kind of late this term, aren't they, with the way they're handing these things down? Well, not, not unusual. Uh, as of two weeks ago, there were about a dozen cases that uh, were noteworthy enough to be on the lookout for and they're down to just a handful now maybe three or four that are going to be released here either today or tomorrow so uh it, typical though for the supreme court as the term ends and they go on vacation for july and august to, to get these last decisions out and of course some of them are are, are newsworthy uh the one yesterday really kind of threw me for a loop uh this is snyder versus u.s and involved an indiana mayor who uh, was part of an administration, uh, mayor's administration, in a, in a small town in Indiana. Uh, that administration awarded a $1 million contract to a trucking company uh, for garbage trucks to operate in the city. Well, uh, near the end of the mayor's term, he, he walks over to the, the, the uh, trucking company and demands $15,000 because uh, reportedly he's having some financial difficulties. Through some wrangling and, and, and negotiations, uh, that number is whittled down to $13,000, and the trucking company writes him a check, and out, out the door he goes. Uh, he gets charged with a federal crime, of course, for basically taking uh, money from a uh, company that was awarded a contract uh, that looks bad, I think, in most people's eyes, uh, gets sentenced, has a two-year sentence. That sentence has been vacated, and, and he has been set free by the U.S. Supreme Court yesterday, which determined uh, through means that are, in my mind, somewhat questionable, that if you receive money up front before you take action as a government official, well, that's considered a bribe. That's a no-no. That's a crime. You're in trouble. But as a public official, if you receive money after the fact, after having awarded a contract or done something uh, for a, a private business, and you receive that as some sort of gratuity or reward, that's not criminal conduct in the eyes of uh, six justices on the Supreme Court, and uh, th that that crime cannot be charged. So uh, it, it puts uh, <laughs> a lot of states and the federal government, including the Justice Department, on notice that, that rewards that people – uh, obtain after working as a, a public official or government official is okay. And uh, I, 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 for the life of me, I can't understand it, but uh, uh, it's okay to receive money after the fact now rather than before you act as a government official. This is like the reverse shakedown. Well, basically. yeah. Uh, and, and Justice Kavanaugh, it really, it, it is a remarkable read. Uh, the opinion, he, he goes into situations where teachers get uh, rewarded by a parent at the end of the school year, or maybe your your hometown mayor gets a plaque, and and he he questions whether or not all of that should be scrutinized by uh, government officials and prosecutors, and and of course no. I mean we we draw the line somewhere, but going in and 
shaking down a company for for thirteen thousand dollars after a million dollar contract was awarded seems to be a bit questionable. I so think, I, I, but the, but it also makes a statement about the carting industry, Joe, that it was not a big deal to them that someone came in as a public official and said we're going to need some cash to close this deal out. They're like, yeah, we'll just write you a check and negotiate it down to thirteen. They thought nothing of it. And in that business, that's that's a deal. So it, exactly, it, and the analysis I would have undertaken as a, as a sitting justice would be, oh, well, what was the quid pro quo here? What did the mayor do to earn that money? And was it was a 1099 issue? And did he pay taxes on? It? That's the analysis to mm -hmm. determine whether or not this is just, you know, some sort of payback scheme versus uh, money that was actually earned. Jo Joe, um, I haven't had an opportunity to read that, so I apologize. But couldn't this be fixed with a tweak of a federal statute? Well, I, I hope. Matt, and that's a good point. I, I hope that uh, Congress will go back and say, okay, look, we have some federal anti-corruption statutes. Uh, we don't want public officials to be able to go out and, and, and get paid back for what they were able to do while in office. And uh, we, we need to be a little bit more explicit so that uh, we can address Justice Kavanaugh's concerns that uh, a teacher receiving uh, uh, you know, some sort of a nice gift from a parent after the school year is not going to be scrutinized. I and, think that could be done. And I would think that uh, before anybody just says that this is a, you know, the Wild West now for elected officials, there, there still are state laws on the books that can be a lot more constraining than what was interpreted in this instance, I would think. Well, I, I agree, and let's hope so, because, uh, yeah, you, you don't want the Wild West out there, and you don't want – government officials, uh, you know, as, as soon as they're term in, being able to go around and cash in. I mean, that, that's just unseemly. Why was this charged under a federal statute instead of a local statute? Uh, well, I think part of it was because uh, the, the, uh, the good mayor did not declare the income. <laughs> in fact, when, when he was confronted with this, John, he gave a thousand different excuses for what the money was actually for because he realized it was illegal activity. Uh, yet, despite the consciousness of guilt that he exhibited, uh, the Supreme Court saw it differently. But I, I think this also ran afoul of some, some taxation issues. Well, I was disappointed to see that there were no Italian names involved in this case, Joe. But if you go far... with the garbage. Truck, <laughs> yeah. <right? laughs> if, you, if you go far enough down the storyline, though, you can find some. Because there's, a, there's an article about this case uh, that was published and uh, in the Chicago Tribune, and eventually you get to a name called Pramajore, uh, which I was pretty excited to see. So, uh, but uh, it does it does change the whole business model, though, uh, and it, it's it's questionable this decision making because you could very easily just say, "Here's the deal. I'm going to engineer. I'm going to rig this bid. You get it after you win the bid. You give me this amount of money." I mean, what's the difference? Well, sure. Yeah. Uh, all you have to do now is say, "Look, you know, don't pay me up front, and we're going to be okay." And and really, you can now, yeah, other than yeah, what which, Matt had said. Yeah, and it's it's going to be the law of unintended consequences here, I, I suspect. And I, I believe what Matt Harvey says is going to be true. They're going to have to go back and tweak these uh, anti-corruption statutes. So the envelopes of cash become a promissory note. So, uh, it, it, essentially. It, yeah. And it doesn't even need to be cash anymore. It could yeah. be a check. You put them on the payroll. Consulting fees is how they uh, regard this one. You could just put a monetary value. I mean... West Virginia, there's ethical laws out there now in West Virginia that kind of define what is appropriate, like a, 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 a plaque or uh, a comped meal, mm -hmm. and there's limits on that so, in place in West Virginia. But, so this this is not wouldn't be too hard for them to fix. But doesn't this decision negate that? Essentially, say that that those those no, laws aren't so. applicable. I, I haven't read the decision, but I, if it's applying that statute as it's written. In its application, it, it it might not stand that all uh, all statutes are are void. But I don't know if this is like a free a First Amendment, Fifth Amendment argument that they made, um, or just a pure statutory interpretation. I've seen Joe, a lot of Lamborghinis on Capitol Hill in Washington. Let's move on to <laughs> uh, the decision regarding social media and the Biden administration that was handed down yesterday. Yeah, interesting case, uh, Murphy versus Missouri, a case where uh, a couple state attorney generals and, and uh, 
from private citizens banded together to sue, claiming that the Biden administration was guilty of uh, jawboning and influencing social media platforms in terms of what content was uh, posted. Uh, And this centered around uh, two things, the 2020 election and all of the uh, heated debate that took place regarding whether or not that was a stolen election or a valid election, and then COVID. Uh, And uh, the the concern by the federal government that some of the postings on there were were not only misleading about COVID-19, but dangerous in terms of uh, the the societal impact. Uh, If you have misinformation regarding the virus, what you're supposed to do to protect yourself and others, whether the vaccines are safe, Uh, The federal government claimed that they had an interest in making sure that the content was not injurious to the public. Uh, The case uh, was decided again on a 6-3 vote, and uh, it was determined that the federal government in these instances did not uh, improperly influence these social media companies regarding their content. And I I believe it was, uh, forgive me, it might have been Amy Coney Barrett who wrote this decision, but she uh, looked at whether or not there was actual harm that was alleged by these uh, petitioners before the Supreme Court, whether they could really prove that there was some sort of injury or harm suffered by them due to the uh, actions of the federal government in their communications with the social media companies. She, she ultimately decided that, that there was insufficient evidence of that harm, and that and that is a prerequisite for you know when bringing a case you have to establish that there's been some sort of transgression and uh, in, a, in terms of causation there has to be some sort of harm directly caused by that act or conduct and in this case the six of justices decided there was a, a lack of evidence in that regard so uh, they decided in favor of the Biden administration now going I don't think this is the end of that debate regarding censorship uh, you, you may recall Jim Jordan had a congressional committee having hearings all, all over this. And, uh, in, in fact, uh, they filed amicus curiae briefs uh, in support of this case. And uh, I suspect congressional action is going to continue in that regard. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the Republicans maintain, maintain control after this next election cycle that they'll try to pass laws to prohibit in many respects, what a federal government can do in terms of their communications with social media companies. Wasn't there a standing issue also in, in this decision? Lacking because, standing was the term. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and, well, and, and that's in part and parcel the, uh, goes to the question of whether or not there's damages. Because to have standing, you, you have to be, of course, affected by the conduct you're suing over, and you have to be harmed uh, as a result of that. And uh, that that gives you the standing uh, to come forward and say, I'm a proper plaintiff here in my case. And in this particular case, uh, the the court cited the lack of evidence of uh, standing based upon the fact that there was no recognizable harm caused by the uh, government conduct that was complained of. Let me ask a non-lawyer question here. Why do you have to have standing and why must there be harm? for a case like this to turn out to be favorable? Uh, Because if not, if we did not have those prerequisites, then anybody could file a lawsuit over anything. And and so, for example, if if your cause is the ethical treatment of animals and uh, you want to come forward and say, hey, you know, I I want to file lawsuits over this because these folks are doing this and and they're, they're, say, they're running lab tests on animals and all, and now animals, that's probably a bad example because animals can't speak for themselves. But in, in terms of bringing forth a case, you have to be able to show that you were one of either either you're solely affected by it or you're part of a group, maybe a class action or maybe a group of plaintiffs come forward and say, I've been harmed. For, and you can go to the case regarding the, uh, the doctor's group who came forward with the uh, Mifepristone case, claiming that. Uh, so many women were getting harmed by use of this drug. The FDA imp- improperly approved it. And we as doctors now are, are suddenly being harmed by that. They were unable to establish with the Supreme Court what harm they actually suffered. Statistics show that they didn't have a, a whole group of women coming into ERs uh, 
complaining about injuries associated with Mifepristone. Uh, so the court said you, it didn't get to the actual merits of the case, but said, hey, you got to have some sort of proof that whatever it is you're complaining of is directly harming you. Uh, otherwise, we'd be filing suits over everything. So any cause, any any concern or complaint you would have, you would march off the court and say, I want this litigated. Well, you know, fortunately, our courts demand that uh, you have some sort of skin in the game here and that, that uh, that's a, a problem directly relatable to your personal situation. And uh, it, it's a good gatekeeping function for the courts. you got to establish that uh, the person before you with the lawsuit actually has a beef. And it's not just uh, trying to produce a result for a cause they believe in. Mr. Harvey, did you have a comment? Oh, I, I was just going to use the example. Like, I couldn't sue someone in John's neighborhood f- through their HOA. Because you don't live there. Because I don't no live there. Interest. And, you know, have no, yeah. Makes sense. Hey, let's get to the debate for tonight, uh, Joe. This is an interesting format. <laughs> the uh, Earlier this morning, I played a, a couple of segments from the previous debate where you had Chris Wallace basically almost giving up and walking out, <laughs> scolding, scolding both Trump and Biden at one point saying, well, the two of you are raising your voices. Why shouldn't I? Uh, they're muting the microphones tonight, so we shouldn't have that three-ring circus we had the last time these two got together. We hope. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, interesting. This is the first debate in, in a very long time that's not being run by the Presidential Commission on Debates. Uh, and remember, Rob, a couple of years ago, we uh, that issue came up, and, and it was clear that the political parties were not going to cooperate with that commission on debates. So here we are, uh, a debate set up really because the two candidates decided it was probably in their best interest to do so. And uh, it's being moderated and run by CNN uh, uh, here in in Georgia at Atlanta studios. And uh, the format is such that, yeah, there's not going to be a lot of that uh, back and forth and uh, exceeding your time in terms of answering questions so it it, by its nature it does instill some discipline in the candidates and how they conduct themselves because they can talk all they want no one's going to hear with the mic off and no no studio uh, audience either by the way yeah right which uh, a lot of people speculated is to trump's detriment because uh the former president uh, is a master at playing to the audience, and and uh, but I I, I kind of like the the lack of audience uh, myself because I I mean they're just stacked with with staffers and supporters and a lot of hooting and hollering and carrying on when when uh, it's it's the, to me it's distracting from trying to listen to the substance of the debate uh, and I'm kind of glad it's going to be a little more sterile this time, Mr. Gilstrap. You see these two candidates. What does each one need to do tonight? Joe, we'll see if you agree. I, it's a, I think everybody who's watching this debate, 95% of everybody who's watching this debate has pretty much made up their mind. And uh, for a Trump supporter to decide, I'm going to vote for Biden instead of Trump yeah, or the other it. way it's, it's around. The, it's the independents in the middle that you exactly, need to talk to. Exactly. That's what I was, what I was yeah. going to. So it's for the independents to make up their, their minds. I don't know how the the... Given given the stakes and given the differences between the, the, the two players, I don't know how one sells over the other because they're both such damaged candidates to begin with. Um, uh, uh, Biden, if I think if Biden gets lost in what looks like a senior moment, if he wanders off mentally or if the, the perception or is even he physically. wanders off or, or physically. <laughs> but I think what will happen then, and this is where the, the, the cries of unfairness are going to happen, if the CNN moderators then rescue him and say, well, Mr. President, you were talking about such and such and so and so, instead of letting the silence play its game while doubling down on what President Trump says and, and fact-checking him at, at every syllable, uh, it, if they ask the question and they let the candidates run for however, whatever their period of time is without interruption, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But I, I, I think most people are expecting uh, 
they're, they're expecting Biden to just kind of drool into the microphone and they're expecting Trump to have this this screaming match into the microphone. I think everybody's going to be disappointed. I think I think both are going to perform well. Matt Harvey, what are you expecting? I expect it's going to be really boring um, because of the muted buttons and no, because of the, no audience. That's right. And um, I think this is more important to Joe Biden uh, because, like John said, the expectations of his capableness have been lowered so much if he just comes up there and stands there and delivers uh, and he's going to be able to talk about policy and get into some of the nitty gritty that was the thing that trump did back in 16 so masterfully is he could just you never knew when he was going to pull out the kitchen sink and hit you with it and you couldn't really stay on you couldn't stay focused and on message and um He's not going to have that advantage this time. So, to me, I, again, it's always about that that one, two, three percent that's that's persuadable. Um, in the particular state, it appears now we got which are the battleground states. So, I think it's about energizing your base at this at this point. Mr. Ferretti, you get the final hundred seconds. Well, I, I think that uh, to me, the the goal. For each of these candidates should be to, to bank the reliable voters that, that they need. I, clearly, both have 38 to 40 percent of their their true believers uh, in the bank, but there's still a little mushiness on each side of the ledger here regarding their supporters. And I think for Biden, this is a chance to shore that up and show that he's not too old. He's still up for the job, and the, the, some of the Democrats can can stop pining for Michelle Obama or Gavin Newsom to step forward at the last minute here. I think he's got to do that. And with Trump, uh, he's also got a, a little bit of mushiness there in terms of Republican support. He, he's, yeah, he certainly has his true believers, but I think he has to show that he has the, the temperament and the self-control to, to uh, convince these supporters that he's going to win some of those people in the middle. As far as the people in the middle, I, I don't know that you know, five months before the election, I don't know that those folks are going to be ready yet to make up their mind. Uh, so I think that may be for a subsequent debate or some more campaigning before we really reach those folks. But I think the goal here is to, for both guys to shore up their, their uh, base support and make sure they don't have any defectors. Thank you, Joe. Good to talk with you again. Okay, fellas. Have a great show. Take care. Play well. 9 p.m. debate tonight, and I believe the next one is September 10. Anybody who screws up too badly tonight can make up for it September 10. So, you know, I think it's a preliminary. It's, I wouldn't put too much weight in this one unless it's just totally disastrous for one or the other.